because for these two ways. Finally, I must tell you what the arrow is for the net result. When the thing can happen in alternative ways, you do what we call add the arrows, and it doesn't mean any, how do you add no arrows? I know how to add numbers, how do you add arrows? The rule for adding arrows is the following. You simply put one arrow head on the tail of the other. If I wanted to add these two arrows, I would do it as follows. This is the first arrow. Let's say that's one and that's two. That's the first arrow. And then I just draw the second arrow off from the first one. Okay? It's exactly parallel. It's drawn the same, but it's centered. It's moved to there, right? You tie one onto the other, head to tail. And the result is supposed to be the sum. The adding is this net arrow that you would get from where you started to where you ended. A way of thinking of it that's rather nice is to think of each arrow as indicating the direction of a step to be taken. We take a step on this plane this way, and then we take a step that way, and we say, how, where did we actually move? We could have done it all in one step, this one. So this is the one step which is equivalent to the succession of the other steps. Adding means putting together steps, thinking of these arrows as steps that you do in succession. This added arrow is the final result for the chance of a reflection. The square of this arrow determines the probability of reflection. I have to have erased the blackboard because I haven't got room. So I'm reconstructing here on a smaller scale a diagram that we had made earlier, which was the reflection as a function of thickness, which I'm trying to explain. And this is up to 16%, remember? Averaged 8% and started at zero. Now let me explain why it's true, if I follow these dippy rules. This must require an incredible accuracy of measurement. Not particularly. Not this one. I mean, timing here. Oh, the, no, but you see the timing is automatically taken care of by just the distances. The timing is very short. But we, the distances. Well, we have to have the distances good, yes, but you see, if this is put in a fixed position, it's a definite distance, whatever it is. We don't actually have to know exactly how this is turned. We have to know the relative turn of this and that. That is, that's a nice point. Suppose that I made a mistake in that distance. Well, I moved the photomultiplier a little bit further away. Then this arrow here, the red's going to indicate what I would calculate if I had the, a little further away, the photomultiplier. Then this arrow would have turned a little further, right? And this arrow would have turned a little further, always in the same direction. Yes? And now I want to add these two together, which I will do again, just like I turn blue to black, I'll turn red to orange. I'm going to add the red ones. It's a new problem. He moved the photomultiplier on me, and I'm doing it over. So I make this step, and then I make this step. OK? And then I get the final result, which we'll draw in purple that corresponds to the other green one there. And uh, it looks like it's the same size, doesn't it? Maybe I cheated, I'm good at drawing. But it is exactly the same size, because if you think about it a little while, since you turn this arrow by a certain extra angle, and this one by the same amount extra, because when you move the photomultiplier, the extra time is the same for both, the extra time. So the extra turn is the same for both. It's the same as just turning both arrows together which is simply turning this diagram. But turning this thing doesn't change its length. And the probability that we're calculating depends only on the length. It's the square of the length. It doesn't depend on the direction. Can't you get that directly from the glass thickness? From the glass from the glass? Absolutely. You mean that there's this angle here, this delay? Yes, yes, and we're going to do that right now. And that's exactly right. That's why you don't need the accurate measurement that you were you don't talking about. You don't really need that distance to get this probability get because. Only the thickness of the glass is important in computing the length of this arrow. The direction of this arrow does, in fact, depend upon exactly where the photomultiplier is, but it doesn't affect the probability that you'll get a count, because the count is measured by the length of this arrow squared. Right? So it's the scale and not the No, because I need this. Sometimes I might have three surfaces, and I may not have a photomultiplier there, but when I get there, I have another surface that a light reflects from, and so on, so let me have it with arrows. But when you finally want the probability for something, then at the end, you square the arrow. For this application, it doesn't, it's the same answer here as here, okay? 
But if I had, instead of putting a photomultiplier there, I had put another surface there, then the exact location of it becomes very important. Okay? I had another reflection with another photomultiplier somewhere else. It would be a different problem. But let's just do this easy problem first. Let me explain why this result would occur if these rules were right. Why, if we count the beans by this way, we get this result. Let me show you, all right? Let us, can, he's already seen it, as a matter of fact, from his questions. Suppose that we would do the problem over again, not this time moving the photo multiplier, which was we found out was an un effect, didn't change anything. So I'm going to erase the red and orange to get space. I'm now going to ask you to think of another circumstance in which I change the thickness of the glass by increasing it, let us say, a little bit. So I do the experiment over again, and now my red and orange and all that's going to correspond to thicker glass. To make it very clear, I was going to do it over again in which the back end of the glass is here instead of where it was before. What happens? The re amplitude, well, I mean the arrows, the arrows are called amplitude, so I may sometimes say amplitude instead of arrow. It's just a word. Right? We can have any word we want, like it says in Lewis and Carroll. Mm -hmm. Lewis Carroll, I mean. The reflection, from the amplitude corresponding to reflection from the first surface is this arrow turned by the distance to the photomultiplier, which is that. Changing the position of the second surface has no effect on that arrow or that amplitude. Instead, however, the one which went down to the new surface and back is changed. Why? Because it has to go further now. And in going further, it will be turned more. So it will be in this position instead of where it was before. This corresponds to turned more because it's thicker. This is the one that's thicker. All right? Now we have to put these two arrows together. And I'll do that over here. The black one for the old one, which is the same as it was before, straight up and down. That happened accidentally for my drawing. And then this red one, which is now, I'll draw in red uh, again. I don't want to change all the colors all the time. Out this way more, right? You can see it. I'm trying to draw it parallel. Just like I do this black one parallel, I'm drawing that one. I'm making the two steps again. But this is the first step this time. And this is the second step for the new experiment. So there's a first step and second step for the new experiment. The result in this new case is the new green arrow. I've got so many colors and I have so many possibilities, it would be just sensible to put the right color caps back on them in case I want to get the right color. Right? But I can't resist having every color in the rainbow on this diagram, but I don't know that it helps any. At any rate, we have this green arrow here. You'll notice it's longer. And why is it longer? Because this angle opening is greater. So it's longer, and being longer, its square is greater. And the probability of reflection, then in the new situation, should be larger. The probability of reflection will depend upon the thickness of the glass. And in this particular example, this may have been the first point, and this may be the second point. That is, it increased as we increased the thickness. That's how it works. Simple as long as you believe all this, that it'll work. I mean, yes, it is simple. It's just drawing arrows. Zero reflection. We'll see that in just a second. I just want to see if there's any other question uh, that I'll answer that. We're going to do all the different thicknesses and get this whole curve now. But that's exactly what the wave theory tells you. Of course, because the wave theory gives the right answer too. But the wave theory doesn't give the count. It doesn't calculate probabilities. This is for calculating probabilities. You just rename hmm? the audit. You call it instead of reflecting probability. It's not just a name, because when we measure, we measure probabilities. We measure average rates. We don't measure, we can't get a quarter of a photon. Yes, the mathematics is exactly the same as the wave, because it's a very simple mathematics. But it doesn't mean the wave theory is right, because it predicts wrong things about the photomultipliers, for example, that it's counting, that it's chance. That's a very important difference. It's not the photon, the wave theory would have the waves there weak at the photomultiplier. But what the wave is, what is it? It's supposed to be energy. No, it's probability. A wave of probability? Yes, that's what. OK? No, I mean, uh, you, you get to the dual slip.
slit later. Which it doesn't make, have the dual slit right now. I mean it's, it's we have what you call a dual slit. He knows too much, see? <laughs> so the problem is... We have to undo some of your lumber <laughs> that we talked about. So how, how does it happen? The, the two photons go up. There's no two photons. Well, I mean the power It's one photon. And then they hit together and they hit There's no two photons. There's one photon. And it's either there or there, and we're trying to find out the chance it's here and the chance it's there. That's very important. I want you to get used to it. I know, but I mean, it's still, it's not, it's, uh, The same mathematics is the way we equate. Sure, sure. The mathematics is the same, but instead of calculating what you call the intensity, you're computing the probability of finding a photon. The fact that you made this change of interpretation means that the pictures of the waves must be, is physically incorrect. Okay, so we remove the picture and just make the calculation. That's what happened. We're not going to change the calculation because the other numbers were right. In the direction of flight, how long is a photon in terms of wavelength? In this particular example, when it's monochromatic, it's infinitely long. But that kind of question is the kind of question we were talking about. If you try to make the model too correct, it isn't going to be right for some other question. Just sit down, just follow the arrow. And then you'll get everything right. That's right. And if it isn't infinite duration, it's not perfectly monochromatic. But if it's nearly yeah, monochromatic, <laughs> these are irrelevancies, please. Okay. okay? They are not really irrelevancies in the greatest delicacy, but everybody isn't up to your level of worrying about this particular problem, which I'm is not. I'm worrying about the duration of the excitation of the photo multiplier by one photon. I know. It's an unnecessary complication to worry about that here at the present time, okay? Yes, of Okay, fine. Uh, what I would like to do now is get this whole curve from this to see how it really works. So let's start by taking the case that the glass is very, very thin. Very thin. Then the two times are the same. Let us keep the photomultiplier here and the front surface exactly here so that in every example the front surface arrow is this one. And now let's figure out what the back surface arrow is in different cases. And we'll find these pictures coming out like this. I should have used a different color here so you'd know this was the back surface arrow, okay? Here's our front surface arrow. I'll make it larger so you can see it better. I know shouldn't have done that. I should have left the scale exactly the same. Yes, I shall do that. It's not we change too many things, you get mixed up, and there's no need to change. There's the first arrow. That's supposed to be that one. Now on top of that one, I have to add, by the other step, the second one. Let me draw the second one. This was a small thickness. This was thicker, some thickness. We we'll call this thick, thicker, and very thin. Where's very thin? We noticed that this was very close to here. They both turn the same amount. And since they started opposite, very thin <coughs> would be here. That would be where it would be for very thin. I'm drawing them all on top of each other. Of course, they're all separate calculations for separate experiments, and it's a little confusing. So let's just draw it all over again for the case that it's very thin. This would look like this, same again. This one, however, would be exactly opposite. Why? Because if it's zero thickness, there's no difference in time for the front surface and the back surface. Therefore, they both turned around a billion and a half rotations. This is a half a rotation extra net. And this is a half a rotation extra net, therefore upside down. Now let's put these two steps together. First, we have the first step for the first arrow. And now we have the second step for the second arrow, which is a step back. Although I've drawn it to one side so that you can see it, it should be tied right on to there. And where do we end up? We end up right here. So let me draw it very carefully. Actually, I made it for the case that there's a tiny thickness so you can see it. Then you see that the green arrow is at virtually nothing. In fact, it is zero. If it was exactly opposite, the net result of making a forward step followed by a backward step is to bring you right back where you are. There's no net motion. And therefore, there's no probability of getting a reflection. That's why a very thin piece, I mean, that's in cons consonance with the experiment that says that a very thin layer gives nothing. Now, OK, now we keep on going, and we try to imagine what happens as it gets thicker. All that's happening is that this arrow 
goes around and comes to here and then goes back down and goes around and so on relative to the first one. So you answered your question. You imagine what happens if you take an arrow here and then for different thicknesses, and I'm going to draw it all for succession. I'm now going to draw the result for 16 experiments in which I go here, 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 here with different thicknesses, okay? The 16 results look like this. Maybe it isn't going to come out 16, huh? That's no thickness. There's a little thicker, more, a little more time, the case we drew before. Still thicker. These are not straight lines, unfortunately. A little, they should be. They're a little thicker, a little thicker, a little thicker, a little thicker. That's more turn, right? These are the way these things come until finally, when the thickness is just right, it's turned one whole extra revolution because of the extra time. Then it's back to this case, and it keeps going around. And how long is the green arrow? Well, the green arrow starts at zero, and then it gets a little bigger, and it gets bigger, it gets bigger for the different cases. And finally, it's way up this way. That's the biggest it's ever going to get. Then it comes down again. Ah, bumps, 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 right? And how high is it at the biggest? You may have forgotten. The original length was a fifth. And this is obviously two-fifths. And when you square two-fifths, two-fifths is hard to square for anybody. It's four twenty-fifths, which is equal to sixteen one-hundredths. Or another way, two-fifths is four-tenths. This is two-tenths. Squaring it is four one-hundredths, which is four percent. Twice it is four-tenths. Squaring it is sixteen one-hundredths which is 16%, which is okay. And that's how it works. It goes up to 16 and comes down and so forth, depending upon how thick the glass is. And this will keep on going as you keep on making the glass thicker and thicker. It's been measured to, I said something like tens or hundreds of millions of rotations. Is this independent of index of refraction of the glass? No. The time, the light that goes through glass is different than the time to go through air. It goes through the glass slower and takes longer to go the same distance as it would for air. So that when I calculate this turn, I have to allow that this, when I'm calculating this extra time, I must be careful to realize that it's not going at the full speed in the glass, but slower. So that's just to change those angles, but doesn't change the result that I got in the picture. Okay? That's why you said earlier that you should pay attention to the time rather than the distance. No, I just like to pay attention to the time rather than the distance. Well, no, it's okay. It's not why I said it. Yeah, I, okay, why I said it. If you take, pay attention to the time then you're, and you say the rule is for time and allow that the light goes at a different speed through the glass, that explains it, okay? Later on, if we get there, don't know if we can make it, but I will explain go further. I will explain why light goes at a different speed through the glass. I will actually improve this thing. I'll give you more details of how this calculation actually goes. I've cheated a certain a bit because I, this is a result of a more complicated calculation that determines that this is one-fifth. It's a result of a more calculated, complicated calculation with arrows that determines as you go through glass the speed at which you're supposed to rotate is different and so forth. These I haven't included, but I've made it a supposed a certain number of things. But those things also can be explained by a, a finer analysis of the arrows, all right? Including the phase change for the back surface. Including the minus sign for the back surface. Yes, I'll explain. All those will be explained, I hope, if we get there, uh, by a finer set of rules, a more detailed set. We'll just take these as properties of glass at the moment. Well, isn't it still, I mean, isn't it still better to use the analogy that you know, you're traveling. Yes. On land, you use a car. Yes. On water, you use a ship. Yes. That's different. And, I mean, on things like this, you know, you, you just have to use wave theory in all respects, including, you know, uh, total refraction, lateral waves. It gets very complicated. Where you have to, I mean, the only guiding thing is wave theory. No, sir. You can't think. No, sir. Um, That's incorrect, sir. Convince you that there's a knowledge. That this is the way to do it. Well, but this, I mean... At this level, it looks like wave theory. You forget that you're computing probabilities. That's not right, according to wave theory. 
And we'll show you circumstances in which the wave theory doesn't work. We had one with the two boxes. If you have problems in which you have two photons, which are correlated in their properties, the wave theory is unsuccessful. Yeah, but it doesn't help you. It only doesn't help you to do this, you mean. But you haven't done any problems with two photons that are correlated. That's nonlinear optics problems, for example. No, right. You haven't done them. Therefore, you don't appreciate. They don't come that way. OK, so because you have a limited range of experience in which you work, you might find that some other model is sufficiently successful that you don't have to do it this way. What I'm trying to show you is a model which was works, ultimately, over the entire range of experience that man has been able to find, not just over the limited range of experience for your particular experiments, OK? It has always been this way, that for a particular range of experiment, a certain idea may be a good, approx good enough approximation and complete enough because you don't do those experiments which get you into trouble with it. And then it may be much easier on the head, if you like, to use that model. It's much more easy to imagine the way it's moving in space and so on. But you will, if you wanted to do a wider range of experiment, get into trouble if you perpetually thought that way. I guarantee you. But still, well, if you start out by saying that what you have today, you know, might be changed tomorrow. That's true, because we have no experiment. And so the current universal model right. is only a temporary model. Uh, perhaps. But why do I go back to your temporary model, which I know is wrong in certain circumstances? No, we're to use it, we're I, not that's perfectly all right, sure. But that's not what I'm lecturing about. I'm lecturing about the physical view over a wider range than your particular experiences. And so I want to tell all that we know, not some approximation which works in part of nature, OK? So that's the reason I'm also, doing it. Also, there's something else that's very important, just to prove that this, that this sort of crazy way of looking at it reproduces all your results perfectly well, which is what you have to do when you invent a new theory. We have to show that it produces some results that he doesn't know about, too, such as the two photon correlations that, that were the, those boxes in the beginning. Well, then you get in the line spectrum and all kinds of things, the wave theory falls apart. There's lots of difficulties with it. It's got mostly to do with probabilities. That, that, that you can't interpret the wave as a probability. And all it really is is that the wave is interpreted as a probability instead of as an intensity in first approximation with one photon. When there are photon correlations, it has to be done with arrows. OK? A little stretch. Sure. Is that OK? Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. I don't like a stretch. I like the fact that you possibly do that. So you right. say your wave of probability is a sea of arrows? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. If we have uh, more surfaces, well, let's see, what should I describe next? We appreciate the plus. No. I would like to talk about what happens if there are more surfaces. All right? If there are more surfaces. For example, if I had a layer of glass here and then of air, much like you like to make, and then we would have another layer of, let's say, glass of a certain thickness, something like that. Maybe not the same thickness as this one. Well, let's erase the red line to make the picture a little easier. If we have thicknesses, four of them. Then what happens is that we would make four ways that the light could go, if you imagined it. Uh, you could say it goes to first surface, second surface, third surface, and fourth surface. And then we would have an arrow for the first surface case, an arrow for the second. If these were different materials, they weren't both glass, they may not be the same length of arrow. Some other arrow for the third, excuse me, I made it wrong. An arrow from the first surface, an arrow from the second surface, Another arrow, let's say it's bigger, let's say it's thicker glass, I mean a uh, different kind of glass, lead glass, so it's not one-fifth, it's a little bit bigger. This is the third surface and this might be the fourth surface. How do you put them together? You consider them, seek, you add them, again with the word add, we use the word add, but what we mean is we find out what the net result would be of the sequence of steps. In other words, we try to find out where we would end up if we made a series of steps, this step followed by that step followed by that step, and the easy way to do that geometrically is to draw one and then draw the next one on the end of that. That's number two. And then number three on that. I didn't draw it quite at the right ang correct angle. And then number four. And then the net result for the probability 
would be the square of this length. In other words, the area of a square set on that arrowhead. That would be the answer. So when we have any numbers of surfaces, all we do is figure out the arrow corresponding to each one and tie them together by what we call addition, which is really seeing what happens if you do a sequence of steps corresponding to those arrows in succession. An interesting point about adding, which is fun, with numbers it's true that 5 plus 4 is the same as 4 plus 5, and it doesn't make any difference in what order I add them. If you play with this a little bit, you'll discover that if you make a series of steps of different lengths and angles, you'll get to exactly the same place with what, no matter what order you make the steps in. If you make the big step this way, followed by a small step that way, you get to here. Whereas if I made a small step that way first, and then the big step, I get to the same place. And it'll turn out, if you play a little bit, that if you tied arrows on each other's ends, but kept the same arrows, but tied them in different order, it'll come to the same answer. So this addition also has that property. It doesn't make any difference. You don't have to decide which is first and which is second when you're adding these things together, OK? You just put them together, and it will work whichever order you choose. Now I would like to describe the language you use to describe this, right? We call the arrows, actually, a physicist calls an arrow an amplitude. He actually more completely sometimes calls a probability amplitude. All it means is a quantity, which one squared, or rather which one you find the area of the square corresponding to the arrow, is a probability. The word probability amplitude is just, I could have better say, it, probability arrow. What I mean is that the, uh, you use the arrow to find the probability by figuring out how big an area of a square on it is. So these could be called probability arrows. Actually, technically, these arrows are called amplitudes. It's just another word for these arrows, right? So no complication. Now, I would like to use the word amplitude because I'm so used to it. It probably would be easier for me to say the probability arrow associated with this rather than the amplitude associated with it. But I'm used to using amplitude, and we might as well, we might hear the word somewhere else, and now you'll know what it means. So what we do is this. Does that include Yes. The amplitude is a... No, it's not the area. That's the probability. The amplitude is the arrow with its angle and length, the combination. That's the amplitude. It's the full arrow. It's got two aspects, the length and the angle. That's the amplitude. Amplitude and arrow is the same, all right? Just get used to that. Now. We have discovered uh, from our experience with the boxes and also from talking about this, that it will not work out right and we'll get into all kinds of trouble if we would say something like this, that this particle in the classical sense, that this photon has a certain, comes down to here, there's several ways it can get to here. It can come from this surface or it can come from this surface. There's a certain probability to bounce from this one and a probability for the bounce from that one. That will not, we've noticed that because if there were, a probability to bounce from the front surface and the probability to bounce from the second surface, if you added those probabilities together, you couldn't get zero, as you sometimes get, for certain thicknesses. Because all probabilities are always plus. So that theory, that, that may of describing that we say the photon probably does this or that or that, is much like with our boxes that they're probably red, red, green, or green, red, red, or whatever they are, before we open the box. In other words, before the photomultiplier reads, we cannot say, we do not say that this photon either goes this way or that way or this way. But we do say, following language, it has an amplitude to go this way. It has an amplitude to go from the second surface. It has an amplitude to go from the third surface. It has an amplitude to go to the fourth surface. Then you add the amplitudes together to get the amplitude to arrive here. The amplitude to arrive here has only meaning in the sense of the probability of arriving here, which is the square of the length of the amplitude arrow. So, to say it again, every event that we want to calculate, we calculate a probability. These probabilities are always the square lengths, the area of the squares, associated with arrows, translation, associated with amplitudes. For every process, we compute an amplitude for that process. The probability of that process is the square of the amplitude, the, the square going on the arrow, right? The amplitude for a process which can happen in several alternative ways in your imagination is simply the sum of the amplitudes for each of the individual ways. In other words, the arrows, total arrow is the sum of the arrows for each of the ways. So that it turns out with this happy way 
that we can blithely go along and thinking of that happening as alternative different ways, but not in the probabilistic sense, but that in the amplitude sense. There's an amplitude for it to happen in all these ways, and we have to add those amplitudes. That permits cancellations and so forth. Arrows, when they add, can come out zero. Probabilities can't. You can't add two positive numbers, two chances, and get nothing. So, uh, but with arrows, you can. So what we, the language we use is to say that there's amplitudes for different possibilities, and to find out whether it's actually happening, with what chance it happens, we have to, in the end, when we know the amplitude, find the square area that belongs to that amplitude, that arrow. Right? That square area has no direction. Right? No, it's just a, a way of my describing just squaring the length. It's a numerical process. It, you don't have to draw that square. But for people who don't want to calculate, I just draw the square to, to indicate the bigger the square, the bigger the probability. If the arrow, like an, an example of that, why it's nice to draw the squares and you don't have to calculate anything, is remember this last one where we had the full maximum corresponding to this position here. Then we had an arrow this long, which was two units, twice as long as the original one alone would have been twice as long as the first surface. If it were the first surface alone, it would have been so big, but it's not, it's twice as big. Now if we draw a square on it, and compare that to the square from the first surface alone, with a little bit of drawing, we can see that there's four of these squares, and therefore it's four times more. So for individuals who can't square numbers easily in their head, I've shown you that the double arrow has four times the probability than the single arrow because the probability is the area of the squares. And so therefore, when we had the two surfaces so lined up that their arrows were in what we call in phase, that is, in the same direction. Phase and direction, or angle of the arrow, is the same thing, just the other word. When they're in the same phase, and they go that way, and they add together, then the probability is four times as big as one would have been alone. That's why 16% is what happens, rather than 4%. All right? I was just drawing squares to help you to calculate squares. If you're used to multiplying numbers together, then you can just take the length of the arrow and multiply it by itself. In fact, I did that in this case over here. I forgot that I had invented this square to save me from having to multiply numbers. So I've got it down to the point of counting beans to the last degree, that you can't, don't even have to multiply numbers in order to find the answers to this. <laughs> it's a geometrical square. OK? So that's. Uh, the language we find ourselves using, we talk about amplitudes for possibilities. If I were talking about those two boxes in a more sophisticated way, I'd say there's a certain amplitude that the combination is red, green, green. Another amplitude that it's red, red, red. And I talk about adding those two possibilities, not by adding their chances, but by adding the amplitudes for each, those two arrows together. And that's the way I can get funny numbers that are not what you'd think you'd get with probability. Yes? I think maybe what John was worried about a little bit in that earlier question yes. is just that a, a probability is always a number between zero um, and you know, one. Between, between minus, between zero and one. Yes. And it looks like if you, can, if you have an arrow of any size, when you square it, you get any number. Actually, you can't. These arrows are small enough that when you put them together, you can't get any number. Yeah. It's true. Uh, you mean if I made enough surfaces and had them lined up perfectly, you say, why not? Look, it's a there's 0.5 for each uh, surface. So let's make uh, 10 surfaces. And let's put their position such that the timing is such that all these arrows line up. Then we'll get more than one. The thing will be probably more than one. That's because I made a, m a mistake or an approximation. I disregarded the situation, the fact, and I'll explain later more correctly how to do this right. I made a little bit of an approximation. I assumed that what happened on the back surface that the light that got to the back surface was not already affected by the front surface and so on. We'll come back and explain how to straighten that out later, OK? In fact, I can do it now. Why not? Wire, I've simplified this discussion. And we can even see that in two surfaces, I've simplified it. There's a real, really, there's a slightly more complicated. I've left some stuff out in order to get the rules straight by making it simpler for you, by leaving something out. What I've left out is this. Not quite prepared. I have to go back to my room and, and check numbers and, and see how to explain it quickly. But I'm going to explain the problem. There's, there's several ways that this light could get here. One of the ways is to go to this surface and come to here. That's one end. 
Another way is to go to this surface and come to here. But there's still another way. Can you imagine what it is? Yes. You could go to this surface, then to that surface, then to this surface, and then back to here. That's another little arrow that has to be added on. This is incomplete. There's not just two. There's another one. It turns out that one's particularly small. I'll explain the rules for finding those later. They get very small. They're very small. We could, of course, come down, hit here, go up here, go up here, go back, and go back, but then go up here. So there's a lot of little pieces that I left out. Now, when you have these five surfaces in which you're trying to line that up and make it very much bigger, then all those other new possibilities are also enhanced in such a way that they add up and screw you up so that you don't get more than 100%. The details will be presented next time when I have a chance to lay it out in a simple way. I don't want to confuse it by screwing up while I'm trying to explain it, okay? But there are these other possibilities which we've neglected in this discussion. Uh, yes, I would like uh, to do one other phenomenon that you're familiar with by arrows instead of the standard way of doing it. This phenomenon will bother you still more because it's much easier to understand by common sense. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the problem is this. With these rules of arrows, which is something new, how can we understand everything that we understood before in a different way? In other words, when we have a system of rules, we can't use one rule for one case and another rule for another case. We'd like to see how this kind of rule analysis works always, even though there might be an easy way to guess the answer from a different point of view. I want to show how this consistent point of view produces all results. And the results I'm going to show now, next, are very simple ones, which you would certainly believe and see in a much simpler way. So why do this? Why we do this is I'm trying to show you how this particular theory is the universal theory under everything. It'll produce even the phenomena you're used to, as well as esoteric ones. It does them all. The phenomena you're used to can be explained much more easily by some model, but that model will not hold up if we extend the array, array of phenomena we want to observe. This, however, holds up over the entire range, familiar and unfamiliar. So, the familiar one that I want to discuss is reflection of light from a mirror. And that's easy. So we have here a mirror. In fact, this mirror could have been one surface of glass, if you want. Right? Uh, that's a partial mirror, but it doesn't make any difference. So, so let's take a mirror, and here's the mirror surface. If I shine light straight down and back, we've already talked about an amplitude that it gets sent back, which is a fifth for the surface of glass. And if you make it a good mirror, that one fifth gets to be one from the surface. If you make it perfect, it would be one, yes. That's a theoretical mirror. Yes. Now, if, uh, however, the thing I want to change now is instead of thinking of the light and the situation and the geometry only up and down, I want to think this is a really two-dimensional world. Our source is over here, and our detector is over here. All right? And now I'm going to try to calculate the chance of getting light over there. But what I want ultimately to understand is what everybody knows, is that the light goes and hits the mirror and goes to there such that the angles are equal. It goes. The light goes this way and then comes to here, such the angles are equal. I never made a rule about angles being equal. I talked about arrows. Where the hell are the angles equal? Now I show you, all right? Magic way in which the arrows produce this result. You know what I'm talking about. You, if for this example, if your eye was here, you would see this in the mirror at this location. Actually, it would appear to be back here, the optical effect. It appears to be an image appears over here which is simply the same distance behind the mirror as the actual object is in front. So the eye looking at it sees it here as if the light came from here, but actually it comes from there. And if you figure it out, this angle equals this. Reason is, by the way, if you remember your elementary geometry, that if you were to draw it to that image, not the reason is, but imaging works because, you see, when you have elementary geometry, these two lines make the same angle coming this way as they do going out the other way. This angle here 
is the same as that. But because of the way I've drawn this symmetrically, this angle here is also the same as that. And these two are equal. That's the standard description. It doesn't look very equal on my drawings, but uh, that's supposed to be equal. Now I would like to explain why that is, okay? From this point of view of Aaron. So I'm going to try to discuss this. And here's how you say, why does it go only there? Well, it's very amusing and very interesting to see how it works. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to suppose the light goes straight through the air. We'll later discover even that can be explained. We've been assuming that, but we'll take that. But let's suppose we don't know that light has to be reflected here. And we were to say, for purposes of analysis, that we divide this mirror into very tiny sections, little spots, little pieces of mirror, okay? Bip, 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 just to think. The smaller you do it, the more accurate your result will be. This is small enough for us. And it goes on, although I don't want to draw. All right, all right, all right. But I want to think of this. I'm going to say, and it's going to be right, what I'm going to say, that actually there's an amplitude to arrive here. I'm going to calculate the amplitude that a photon arrives, which you can do in many ways. One way that the photon may have gotten there is to go down this way and go across to here. Right? Not very likely. I know it's equal angle. Shut up. It's possible. It doesn't know anything about that. Another way, I'll draw in purple so you can see it's another way. It could have gone to another spot and gone to there. but still not the right thing. It could go to still another spot. I love these colors. Let's say it goes to the spot way over here and goes to the photomultiplier. Yeah, right. And by the way, there's still another way it could go. It could go straight to here without going to the mirror at all. That produces very funny effects, as a matter of fact, but we'll put a wall in here or something to stop that light. So let's imagine that this is specially built, that there's a wall in here so that we don't have to consider the light that doesn't hit the mirror, all right? Uh, this, of course, was one of those spots because of my laziness. I haven't drawn enough of these uh, dots in here. Now, yeah, and a point, it's a very tiny detector. Uh, there is the one we're looking for. Let's say this is the one of equal angles. That's in there, too. That's this one. All different, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have bent that line. Okay, let's say that there's this one. Let's put the right one, we'll suppose. Okay? But every one of them is there, and every one contributes an amplitude, a small amplitude, because it's a very tiny section, a little tiny arrow. And I'm going to add all the arrows together, and I'm going to show you, like a magician, how it works, how the mirror works. I'm going to add every one of these cases. Each is equal. Each one of these things is the same width, and although the distance are varying somewhat, they're almost equal in their contributions. Every one of these is equally important. So let's start to draw the arrow. I draw the arrow for this one, a tiny little arrow at some particular crazy angle that depends upon the total time to go from here to here. In fact, just for fun, well, no, it's too silly to draw the blue one and the purple one and the black one as arrows. But, okay, this, the blue one is going to look like this. See, the arrow contribution from the blue one. Now the purple one has about the same width and some slight difference in distances, and I'll give you the rules for those arrows, but it comes out almost the same size. However, the time is very different. Because the time it takes to go from here to here and the time it takes to go from here to here are not the same, because if you'll count, well, let's take it's perfectly clear that this distance total is longer than that distance, for instance. They're different distances. Therefore, they're different times. So all these arrows that I'm going to draw, the purple one, the black one, and the green one, they all correspond to arrows in some up crazy directions, depending upon the time, all right? And I have to put them all on top of each other. Not just these, I also have to put all the ones in between. Okay, so it's a big calculation, adding thousands of arrows together by tying them one to the other. Remember how to do it, you make the succession of steps. Okay, now we're gonna do that. I hope I have time, yes, I do have time. We're gonna do that, in order to do that, we have to know at what angle to turn the arrows. That angle is the total time taken to go. And the total time taken to go 
is, of course, the distance divided by the speed of light. And so what I need for each of the arrows is an arrow associated with this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot, this spot and so on. In order to figure out at what angle to draw it, I have to know how long it takes or how far it is. OK? So let me make a little diagram or a plot, a graph, of how far, how much distance it is or time. It's the same for us because it's all through air. And it's going this way. And this axis is supposed to really be exactly corresponding to each one of these. In other words, for this particular spot here, I calculate the distances there. For this particular spot here, I should do it in purple, but it takes too long to keep picking up the different colors. Uh, so this one here, it turns out, is somewhat shorter. Uh, this one here may be even shorter. After a while, it's getting long again. As a matter of fact, you can appreciate the one that goes straight down, and if this is some, there's some kind of symmetry, if I happen to have them at the same level, that there'd be some symmetry would go up again. At any rate, the distances, or the time, which is equivalent, because we haven't said what the scale is on the axis, is a curve which goes down to some lowest value and goes up. Unlike my drawing, they should have gone through these dots, so I should have put those dots there, <laughs> moved the dots. <laughs> but you know what this means, then? These are a whole lot of little dots corresponding to the time for each of these places. And there's some place in the middle there somewhere where the time is shorter, and then it begins to increase again. Are there any questions about what that curve is and why it looks that way? Because it's important to appreciate that. I'm not sure where you where you're getting the distance this time. What does that first point go? Good. To? This point point corresponds simply to the total of this length and that length. The total distance to go from here to here and from here to here. So it's a summation of All it is is a summation of those two lines. As a matter of fact, it could be constructed geometrically that way. You can go home tonight and draw a, a, a horizontal and two points, and on the horizontal lay out dots and draw these things and then lay them out, measure them, and then measure this height here should be equal to the total of these two blues. Actually, I don't have room to draw, so the scale is different. I, okay? And you'll discover that there's some distance at which the time is shortest, and then it goes up again. The only thing that really counts in this curve for us are the dots, one corresponding to each one of these little sections. Of course, we can make the sections very fine, have lots and lots of dots if you want to. Uh, now. Is there a little piece of that other curve that you did, the big up and down curve? No, this is entirely different because we're plotting something else. We're plotting the distance to go at different points, and that's not to do with the intensity of light from the other. It's a different problem, and it's a different quantity, and so the axis here is position of the mirror rather than wavelength, and it's entirely different, OK? OK, now with that, when you, this tells us how to draw our arrows, yes? Because it tells us at what angle to draw the arrows. So I'm going to call these number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, and so forth. And I'm going to draw the arrows corresponding to each one. So I don't know where it comes out, but number one, say, comes out this way. And number two is a different time, quite a different time. Maybe more, less time, less time. So I at least should do that right. That's number one. You might not like it because the arrows are small, but I better make them small. I get in trouble. Number two is at a different time. Number three is still less time. Less time means not turned as much. Number four is less time. And I haven't looked over here exactly how far I have to go. But after a while, less time. After a while, the arrows begin to go more or less in the same direction. Why? Because when I'm down near the bottom here, all the times are nearly the same. Therefore, all those arrows, whatever their angle, they're all the same for a while. So if this was called 10, it isn't right, 11, actually, and this is 12, 13, 14, and so on, then this would be arrow 12, 13, 11, 13, 14, almost the same. But after a while, I begin to climb up here. My angles begin to increase again. That is, they get parallel to the old ones. See, so they begin to turn over this way. And then as I begin to climb up this hill, as I change from dot to dot, the times change more and more each time so that the arrows go more and more cockeyed relative to each other, more and more rapidly around that way. 
and they're just millions, millions of them all chained, going crazy. I mean, it, when you're climbing very fast up here, this hour is this way, this hour is this way, this hour is this way, this one is this way. They're all different angles, so it's a big smear. And it was, in fact, if I went all the way back there, a smear at the beginning here. So I wonder if you can understand this, why I got that. I put together a lot of arrows whose angles, let's start at the bottom and go up this way and back that way. As we go up, we add the arrows almost the same angle and then we begin to increase them faster and faster and make a little whirl. Back to the other way, it was symmetrical. I should have been adding arrows, which are nearly the same direction, but all different angles and make a little swirl. That makes this kind of a curve, beautiful curve if done very carefully, called Cornu's spiral. Swirl and more and swirl. Now, what's the answer to the probability of reflection? Jeez, I forgot we were trying to find that. <laughs> oh, yes. So we started with the first arrow, which is somewhere down in the swirl down here and find out where the last hour was. Remember what the net result of all the steps. In other words, we're playing a game. You could almost do it in a room. You say to people, all right, make a step, turn this angle, turn this angle, turn less, turn less, turn less, now I'm going to turn, now I'll turn more the other way, and so forth, and they make this pair. We want to know where they end up. And they would end up over here, which is a sizable arrow, and represents a good probability. So what? So we found that we do get counts. In other words, the mirror works. That's for sure. But what's all this business about the equal angles? Where does that come from? The only reason this arrow is long is because we have a succession of the pieces that are almost in the same direction. The parts in which the things are not the same direction don't make much difference. If we would cut the mirror off, throw it away, throw this part of the mirror away, I should have really, yes. It's better if the other man wins. I mean, just the way it happened. Throw this part of the mirror away. Then that means that all the arrows from here on out are removed. They're not there because the mirror isn't there. Then this length is almost the same. In other words, we don't need that part of the mirror to get the reflection. Likewise, we don't need the part of the mirror on the other side where the things are changing fast. The only part of the mirror that we really need to get the reflection we could throw the rest away. It's just the section in which the times are not changing much. All right? Now, it's a geometrical thing that you have to figure out. Where is that? Where is the place when you move this around a little bit, it doesn't change the timing much? It turns out that's the place of equal angle. I'll show you why in a moment. But if you decrease the size of the mirror sufficiently, yes. then you get in trouble. Yes. And then if you make the mirror too small, then it doesn't really work very well. Furthermore, it doesn't know about angles at, at all because if you put this in any other position, you get that one little arrow, and it's the same size no matter where you put it. Any mirror it loses its knowledge that it's supposed to be angles equal. You only get angle of instance each time you reflect with a mirror sufficiently large. That's rather small in practice. And so ordinary mirrors, you think it's, everything's all right. Yes? It seems to me you can test this theory. Yes? That this, this thing of adding up all these arrows is correct. Yes? Very carefully taking the well, you could. Why don't we cheat this? And, and, All right, good. And get those things back. I know it's 12 o'clock, but because he brought this up and it's very interesting, let me continue a little bit longer. Okay. His suggest this. This sounds insane, what I just said. I mean, I'll put it my own way, but I'll yeah. come back. All this is canceling itself out. It's not doing anything. You don't need this part of the mirror. What I say from this crazy theory that I'm talking about is it really kind of nutsy. I have a whole part of the mirror which I compute a whole lot of little arrows and it's happening and the net result is nothing happens from that part of the mirror at all. It must be a myth that this stuff is happening. Why do I have to include all that junk? Right? Why do I have to add all those arrows which cancel out? They don't add up to anything anyway. I don't believe it. I don't believe that that really is reflected. But he says we're going to check it by a trick. Well, the trick is the following. I think his idea is the following. Something like this. When you make the arrows, let's say down around in here, some of them pointing this way, and some of them are pointing this way, and some of them are pointing that way. For example, as we go along from one point might be this way, the next point this way, the next point that way, the next point that way, and so on, right? Why? And then it comes around and goes around again this way, and it doesn't get anywhere. So he says, Remove the mirror in just those places 
where the contributions would be going backwards. In other words, throw away the ones that are going backwards. Just add the ones that are going forward. As soon as an angle gets like they're getting ready to go backwards, erase the mirror, take them out. Take out the middle, too. Awesome. Just take out the middle. No, just take those out and okay. see where it's going the wrong angle. Yeah. And then the V's are not there. Uh -huh. So it doesn't come back. Then they begin to be the right direction again as they're coming around. Let those be back in. So we go this way for a while. As soon as it starts to go this way, remove them. How? By just erasing the mirror. What would happen if I carefully figured out which ones were giving arrows generally in this direction? In that general direction, if they have a component, so to speak, in that direction, the step is, although not precisely the direction I want, is just forward. I allow it. And when I calculate one that's pointing the wrong way, I simply erase the mirror, make a hole in the mirror in certain places, holes. Well, then there's a place you allow it, and there's a hole, and there's allowed, and there's holes. Well, the holes are made so that this will never back up. And then the result would be that we would get a very nice thing, and we would go blip, 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 blip. These are the same with these arrows. And then it would go straight for a while, and they go blip, 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 blip. And we get a very strong and beautiful reflection even stronger than if the whole mirror is there, it would appear, and that works. You can do that, and it works. In fact, as he said, you can even do this so well that you can forget the whole, this part of the mirror. Let me, that's a good way to think of it. Let me take two more minutes and explain the same idea over again, but even more dramatically. Yeah, let's suppose that somebody said, forget this mirror, it's not even there. What happens then? I have a mirror that's only so long, okay? I go back and I analyze, thanks, I forgot to do it that way. That's the nicest way to do it. I have a mirror only so long. Then in that mirror, all the arrows are just like this. They're adding, and then they go around fast. Everyone is different, because what I'm done is I'm only using this part of the curve. I never got to the place where they're all the same direction. So they're all different directions. You're going all over the place. So we get this thing both going around, going around, going around, and it doesn't get very far from the beginning. The biggest it can get from the beginning is some short distance across here. There's not very much reflection from that. It all cancels out. Now we use his trick that when the arrows are pointing the wrong way, in other words, as we make a contribution, we see it's this way, this way, this way, as we go along from one spot to the next. As soon as the mirror arrows start going the wrong way, like backwards, we erase the mirror. So what we end, end up with is a sex series of only the positive arrows and are therefore able to get a reflection from a mirror which would ordinarily not reflect. If the whole mirror was there, it would not come any light, very little light would come there, because it cancels out. But if I erase the mirror in exactly the right places, let's take less mirror, less mirror. Less is more. <laughs> there, and to your sudden delight, there's a lot of light. And that demonstrates that these parts really were sent, having an amplitude to send light there. And the other parts were also had an amplitude to send light there, but it was opposite, and they were canceling. And this cancellation is not a myth, because by taking out half of it, you get a big effect. This device is called a grating. Uh, it's made the usual way of making it, instead of making it with the little pieces of mirror, although it could be made that way, just to make lines or slices on a plane. Uh, you may have seen these gratings. They used to use them for um, in cars or something. Sometimes you see colored white color on a sign, and as you turn, it changes colors and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's a grating. What happens accidentally is this: I have to, when I cut these things out, I have to figure out the time exactly to know which arrows go backwards, and that depends upon how much a difference in time means, how much rotation. That depends on the color of the light. So if I cut this out so it works for red light, it won't work at this angle for blue light. It only works for the red light. It doesn't reflect blue light very well. However, it turns out accidentally that the mathematical places to make these cuts for red light, for this position of the source and this position of the detector, turns out to be correct, or nearly correct. For blue light, however, if the source was over there, the timings will change, but it still fits together. And the detective or vice versa, just changing the ends. 
when you turn it, it gives different color lights, so it's the same gradient. That's a little complication, but the main point is that this idea that there's a lot of effects in regions where you wouldn't expect them, like in plots of the mirror where angle of incidence is not equal to angle of refraction, is really right, because if I erase plots of the mirror there, I can get an enormous reflection from places where the angle of incidence is no longer at all equal to the angle of reflection. All right? No matter how familiar one gets with that, there's always a bit of awe about that. Yes, because the awe, it, it, it does not be awe if it were waves, you see. But when you realize that what you're doing is counting photons, one at a time, uh, and they decide to come or not come, you just figure this way. With this section of mirrors in here, they're coming. How in the hell, by putting more mirror in there, can I stop them from coming? But that's what happens. You get counts with the holes, try to fill up the hole, and they get no counts. You say, what is that doing? Well, and furthermore, if, if you have that little thing, suppose you had a little mirror section, pieces, the pieces that you took out, you put on another glass plate. So you could, so to speak, bring them up and take them away. But if you take them away first, you get a lot of light. Lots of photons are coming. Bring them up, it would be easier for the photons. There's more places to reflect, and nothing comes. Then take away the blacks, and leave just the greens, and you get lots of light. To both together, nothing. How does that magic work? The blacks making them arrow this way. The greens were all contributing this way. When I have them both, the net arrow is nothing. Either one is something. Either one alone, but both is nothing. That works fine for the amplitudes, but to think logically about probabilities, it makes it very difficult, because you usually think if those would do it and the greens would do it, and you put them both there, they'll do it even better. So uh, we can add amplitudes instead of adding probabilities. That, that is illegal, but adding probabilities is the wrong way to do it. You have to add the hours first and then make the square. Why? I don't know. Nature works that way. 